Hi, everyone. All right, welcome to the very first episode of the Shredder Adventure Series. For those of you non-Shredders that don't know us, my name is Anna, and these are my two daughters. This is Anne Sophie, who's 10, and Zoe, who's eight. Saratoga Shredders are a group of mostly elementary and a few middle school aged girls in the Saratoga Springs and Albany area that ride mountain bikes and are committed to getting more girls on bikes and more girls outside adventuring. We have over 100 girls that have ridden with us this summer and fall, as well as over 30 women that have volunteered time to lead our twice weekly rides. It's been quite the year to be a shredder. Most of you on here are Saratoga Shredders and families of Saratoga Shredders, but we also have some NICA girls and coaches from different teams across the country. Many shredders won't know what NICA is. So just to summarize, NICA stands for National Interscholastic Cycling Association, and it is the middle school and high school mountain bike race organization. So Saratoga shredders, once you're in sixth grade and older, if you're loving the riding and you're thinking you might want to try to race mountain bikes rather than just ride them, you can choose to join one of our local NICA teams. Saratoga has the Grey Ghost NICA team and Schenectady and Niskayuna have Andrew Rizzi's Mountain Goats um, NICA team for those south of us. Anyway, having the NICA girls on here is great as we have a group of girls on here whose age spans young shredders in elementary school all the way up to the NICA seniors in high school. And I see a few moms and dads on here too, which is awesome. The idea of this series is for our shredder girls to get the chance to speak to and ask questions of inspirational female athletes and adventurers. Cyclists, hikers, runners, climbers, mountaineers, women who have spent some or all of their lives adventuring in the outdoors. We have three Olympians and two Olympic hopefuls, including today's speaker, lined up to speak with us, who spend much of their time training to be the best in the world. But we also have adventurers who haven't made a career out of their sport, but will share their passion of their sport and adventures with you. I really hope you'll enjoy these varied conversations, which will run every Wednesday from today until April when we start riding outside again. So a little bit of Zoom admin here. My awesome co-host Tess Moulton is letting folks into this call through the waiting room. And she's also hanging out in the chat room to take all your questions. So this call is all about you girls being able to ask Kate questions about her life and riding. You can ask her about snacks, you can ask about her dog, about her bikes, anything. So feel free to raise your hand if you have a question um, and I'll try and find you in the, the viewer there. Um, and I'll call on you to unmute yourself or you can write or have your parent write a question in the chat box that we can ask Kate if you prefer that. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to Kate Courtney. Kate Courtney. Kate is currently the top female mountain biker in the United States. In 2018, she became the first American to become world champion in 17 years. She has been the UCI cross country mountain bike world champion in 2018, the World Cup overall champion in 2019, and she's aiming for the 2021 Tokyo Olympics. At only 25 years old, she has been two times junior national champion, two times collegiate national champion, three times U23 national champion, and two times elite national champion. I think that adds up to two, four, six, seven, eight, nine national championships, if I'm not mistaken. She's a Red Bull athlete and member of the Scott Schramm racing team. Kate, we're absolutely thrilled to have you join us in conversation today. My girls, I know, have been super psyched for this day for weeks now, having followed you on your World Cup circuit the last couple of years. To start out with, would you mind introducing yourself to the girls and perhaps sharing a little bit about where you grew up and how and when you started riding bikes? All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for including me. I'm, I'm so excited to be here to see all your faces, to connect with you guys. Um, and to share a little bit about, you know, why I love riding my bike, how I got into it, um, and what I'm doing now. So I started riding my bike when I was pretty young, um, at the base of Mount Tam. So I grew up right below that kind of famous mountain. It's actually where mountain biking was originally invented in, uh, the sixties. So they had the first downhill mountain bike races there. Um, and I just started riding for fun with my dad. So, when I was six, seven, you know, your guys' age, I was riding actually on the back of a tandem mountain bike with my dad, uh, you know, once a week on Sundays and we'd go get blueberry pancakes. Um, and it wasn't until I went to high school that I actually discovered that the thing I love to do so much was actually a competitive sport um, and that I could compete. So I know that uh, we talked about NICA a little bit. So National Interscholastic Cycling Association they basically have high school teams um, that is turning cycling into a, you know, regular high school sport. So previously you could play basketball, you could play soccer. Now you also have the option of 
you know, being a mountain biker and participating in these races. And so I decided to try out for the team, um, mostly originally to cross train for running. So I was running cross country in the fall and I loved being outside on the mountain and I didn't want to race track around a little, uh, you know, circle. So I, so I tried out for the mountain bike team, um, started racing, loved it. And ever since I've been competing, uh, on initially the kind of high school level, then the national level, finally the international level, um, and more recently the last three years as a professional on the World Cup circuit. Um, so I would love to, you know, reserve as much time as possible to hear your questions. I'd love to talk to you particularly about snacks, but also about any of your, you know, questions about biking, you know, you can just share stories if you want. Um, but I think for me, it's just, it's great to see so many girls getting out together, hopefully, uh, you know, having some fun adventures um, and enjoying, you know, what can be a lifelong sport. So I think unless there's anything else I need to introduce, I think we can, we can jump into questions. Awesome. Thanks, Kate. And so if any, as I said, if anybody has any questions, they can go ahead and raise their hands. We had one question already in the chat box, which is how often do you strength train versus endurance train? Good question. So um, strength training, I'm guessing endurance being like on the bike. Um, so yeah. I ride my bike almost every day, uh, pretty much every day. And then I get rest days completely off um, a couple times a month. And I do strength training usually two to three times a week. So three times in the fall and more like two times when I'm racing. But I think you know, one thing I did want to share, and uh, we were speaking about this given the end of the year totals, everyone is posting their end of the year totals. And I think it's so easy. Um, you know, I know I would have this mindset when I first started out and I was 15, 16 and looking at these totals and thinking, I have to ride that much. That's what I have to do to be the best. And I think one thing that's really important to remember is to reach the professional level. It's, it's really a long-term process and especially in an endurance sport where you're just building fitness year over year um the real goal is to get a little bit better every year so I was certainly not training that much when I was in high school I was certainly not training that much when I was in college um, I like to give the example of you know I was a full-time college student for four years racing and I actually there were often times where I had three rest days a week um, so I didn't ride my bike at all for three days a week which if you're racing professionally, that's, you know, outside the norm. Um, and I was still able to be successful because it, you know, gave me time to recover and to train really hard, but to feel good and to be at the right level for my fitness and my lifestyle at that time. So, you know, it's, I love sharing what I do for training and how much I train, but I also just wanted to note that, you know, focus on what you're doing now, what feels good and getting just that little bit better every year. And I know if you add a few hours every year, if you add a little bit of string training over five or six or seven years, which sounds like forever, um, it's twice some of your lives, but over that amount of time, like you will be amazed by what you will be able to do in training and then also in competition. Yeah. And I'd love to talk to you about that balance that you seem to have achieved, Kate, in your career so far. Like the fact that you just touched on the fact that you were in school for four years. You weren't just in school. You were at Stanford um, doing your undergraduate degree, which is an incredible school. Um, and so I'm curious if you could talk about that a little bit and how you, um, it sounds like you had more rest days than you normally would mm -hmm. have. Um, but that was also the year that you became world champion, right? When you graduated from Stanford. So it wasn't like, the year you you were or, or, or still at your peak here, but um, that, that you were pulling back on the academia at all. You were full on in school um, right up until race season. So could you speak to us a little bit about that balance that you were able to achieve there? Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, I think I grew up being, as we always say this in my family, I was always a hard worker, but I was never the breakout star in sports. So I don't know if that makes it better or worse, but I would be like the girl on the soccer team with hustle, but I wouldn't be very good. Um, <laughs> so until I found mountain biking where that kind of that hustle, that work ethic really started to pay off and I could see, oh, if I put this effort in, I'll, I'll get these gains out. Um, it didn't really click for me with athletics. Uh, and I think because of that, I had pretty low expectations and my family really supported me, but I wasn't 
you know, aiming to be world champion when I was 15. I was just kind of focused on the next little step um, and didn't know what would really be possible. So given that it was not a decision at all to go to college. Like I love school. I love learning. I still love learning. Um, and I was really excited to get to go to a school that I was excited to go to. Um, and where I, what? What did you study? What was your, your major? I studied human biology. Um, so I, I think initially that decision was so easy and really was something that uh, combined two things I was loving doing. But in the long term, it certainly involves some balance. And, you know, my freshman, sophomore year when I was racing U23, I certainly had more rest days. I just had to ask for help. That was one of the big things, you know, having my parents nearby, being okay with saying, hey, dad, I need you to come drive me to the airport. I need help packing my bike. Um, I made really great friends my freshman year, partially because I could only really be friends with people that were like supportive of this career. Cause I would be gone so much and, um, you know, often having to go to bed earlier or train on the weekends and the people that really thought that was cool and wanted to be involved with it or wanted to ride with me. Those people ended up being really lifelong friends. And again, part of that support team, part of that village that, helped me balance these two um, big passions that I had. Uh, I would say later on, it became a little bit more challenging my senior year. Um, this My senior year, I won the U23 World Cup overall. So I was racing in Europe a lot and um, just kind of had to grind through that year um, and then finally got to focus full time on mountain biking the, in 2018. And that was a, a really big breakout year in my career. Um, and I think, you know, it's easy to say, oh, well, imagine what I could have done if I wasn't in school. Um, but on the flip side, I think that being in school held me back just enough in the right way. So it kept me from pushing too hard and burning out and being too intense and putting too much pressure on myself too early in my career. Um, and I think that's something that is hard to manage yourself and that, you know, was really structured in for me with uh, balancing my academics. Absolutely. That's, that's a great response. Um, we have a couple of questions from the kiddos. Uh, Danielle, do, you, do your girls have a question for us? Can you unmute yourselves? Um, have you ever biked in the winter? Ooh, yes. I, I know that uh, I probably don't have as much of a winter experience <laughs> as you guys. I live in California, so it, it did rain on my ride today, but it typically, it does not snow here um, where I live. So I, I bike a lot in rain and in some colder temperatures, but not as much in the snow. Um, but I do go, I grew up ski racing, so I often go to Tahoe, I'll backcountry ski or cross-country ski. And if you're looking for a fun way to stay fit in the winter, I know professional athletes who only do that um, for the winter months. So there's lots of ways to stay in shape and uh, not have to suffer too much on your bike in the cold. <laughs> awesome. And Scarlett, I think you have a question for Kate. Can you unmute yourself, please? Um, you're sponsored by Red Bull, right? I am. How much Red Bull do you drink? <laughs> Good question. So I work with a nutritionist. I think that's something that's really helped me in my career to learn how to fuel my body, what things are going to help me in racing. Um, and in training, I train really, really hard. So I burn a lot of calories on my bike. And that's something that I think it's really easy to under fuel. So um, my mom has always like raised me to see food as fuel for big bike rides. Uh, and my nutritionist certainly like carries that along. So for me, Red Bull is a tool that I mostly use for racing or competition because um, it does have caffeine and sugar in it, which can be good uh, in certain circumstances like a World Cup race. Um, but I will say that I pretty much didn't use caffeine in racing during high school. So it was something that I kind of started using later on. And I think, uh, you know, maybe, maybe try not to uh, get on the caffeine train too early. It will benefit you later in life if you can use it as a tool and not have it as too much of a crutch. <laughs> and I have one more question. Yeah. What's your favorite race course that you have done? That's a very good question. 
So I think I have to say Lens Hyde, where I won world championships. I'm sure you, uh, you guys all know when you feel really good on a trail or if you have a really good memory out riding somewhere, that kind of becomes your favorite. So for me, I have a really good memory racing on that course and winning a world championship there. Um, and actually my family was there when I won world championships. So that was a really great day for me. And, you know, I think that place is uh, something special because of it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thanks, Scarlett. <laughs> yeah, that connection, right, to the the experience and the ride itself and the course, right? Just uh, do you have, do you happen to have your world championship jersey or a rainbow I can go jersey? get it. Or... I actually, funny story. <laughs> <laughs> this year, 2020 was a little bit of a challenging year to train. I'm sure a lot of you uh, have dealt with a lot of ups and downs in 2020. And as we can see by the Zoom life, it's been a little disconnected. My world championship jersey right now is packed up from when there were the fires in California and we left. And it was like the only thing that I was like, I have to bring this. So I will, do, should I go get it? I'll take that. That would be wonderful. Okay, I'll go get it. It's in its, it's in its like emergency box. <laughs> <laughs> Always good to have the world championship jersey ready. <laughs> and Willow, I see your hand up. I'll have, I'll have Kate answer your question after this. Okay. Let me see if I can see anybody else with their hands up. All right. The emergency box. <laughs> it's actually also, guys, this is Monty. I thought he might be a popular guest star, but oh this my is my God. puppy. And it's pretty, oh, Monty. It's pretty young, right? What? He's so cute. Thank you. Yeah, he's 10 months old. He was certainly a pandemic puppy. I probably would have been uh, traveling. So, we have a few, we'll, we'll do a show and tell, I guess. Um, so this is the uh, original jersey. It still has probably some champagne on it. And metal. Or on the podium, right? Oh on the podium. God. So these are the, the original ones. And then I do have one other thing. So for, I, Oakley's one of my sponsors. And for world championships that year, I asked if I could use sparkle nail polish to paint my, my glasses and my Oakley rep, he was joking. He said, yeah, you can, but only if you win. And I was like, fine, I'm doing it and ended up winning. So these are also in the special box, but they're, and they're extra opinion? sparkle lots. So <laughs> never be afraid to add a little extra sparkle. That's amazing. <laughs> I love that. All the sparkle. <laughs> Do you know what's the um what's the history of the rainbow jersey? Why is it why is it rainbow? Do you know that? I probably should. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> Didn't I'm mean sorry, to I don't know the history, but I will say it's it's a really special symbol in cycling. So the rainbow jersey um is the same across all disciplines of cycling. It's the world champion. Um, and it was very cool for that year to ride in it. And one of the biggest honors was being able to ride here in my community around California, but also internationally in Italy or at races in France. And, you know, people would stop you and come up to you and ask for photos. And, um, especially in Italy, like they are big cycling fans and every coffee shop you go to like 15 kind of middle-aged Italian dudes would come up and be really excited. So um, I think it just speaks to the fact that cycling is such a uniting sport. We all, mo most people know what it feels like to ride a bike. Um, and I think it's something that can really connect us. And that's part of what makes it a really fun sport to compete in, to do with your friends, but also something you can do for the rest of your life. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Willow, could you unmute yourself and ask Kate your question, please? Um. What kind of bike do you ride? Yeah, so I, I'm lucky I have a few bikes, uh, but the bike that I race, it's called the Scott Spark um, and it's a full suspension bike. And that's kind of what I race most of the time. Um, and then I have a hardtail bike. So that has no suspension in the back. Um, and then I ride a road bike a lot of the time as well for training. So I kind of like to mix it up and I get to ride a couple different different types of bikes and I use them for different terrain. Um, but I would say my favorite is the full suspension mountain bike. Monty, go down. 
<laughs> He's playing with his Christmas pig. I don't know if anyone else has has some fun dog toys around here, but that's uh that's what the, the puppy's up to. <laughs> um Addie, you have your hand raised. Can you unmute yourself and ask a question? How far do you ride in a day? Ooh, that's a good question. So it kind of depends on the day. I would say my longest ride ever was 137 miles. So that's as far as I've gone. Um, but an average day will be anywhere from 20 to 80 miles. Um, the 80 is on a road bike. Don't worry. It's, it's a little bit faster. Um, so normally it's around 40, 50. Um, and I have one question from the yeah. chat. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is from Daniel Shaw and they would like to know how did you make the make step up from an Ico to Ico? Very good question. question. Um, yeah. So NICA, I think from my experience is a great program to be a part of. I think it's a really great launching pad to, you know, get into cycling. If you just want to be a cyclist and you want to ride a mountain bike and have friends and be in this great community, it's, that's totally valued. Um, if you want to make it really competitive, if you want to try to win the races, also totally great. So is this really cool environment where everyone could set their own goals and be supported and be a part of a team. Um, and I was, you know, had a, had a great experience on that team and made some of my best friends that are still really great uh, cycling buddies as well. Um, in terms of making the next jump, I think the first step for me was to race nationally. So I raced some pro CTs nationally. I raced the national championships um, and I did uh, actually my junior and senior year of high school was able to go to some junior world cups, which unfortunately they no longer have, but, uh, at the time that was a great next step for me. Um, and I signed my first professional contract, my freshman year of college, and that was for U23 racing, um, on the world cup circuit. So I think, you know, in terms of the steps, I think it's really easy. There's kind of a point A and a point B that, that looks really clear. And there's a lot of different ways that you could transition to being a professional. Um, I think the biggest thing is just getting race experience um, and getting those opportunities to race nationally. And hopefully if you succeed at that level, then getting to go with USA Cycling to um, do some international competition uh, and then hopefully getting to race with a professional team. Awesome, thank you. Um, Divya, do you girls, do your girls have questions for us? Can you unmute yourselves? Do you have any other hobbies than biking? I do, yeah. I think 2020 was a good year for hobbies, certainly. Um, I don't know if any of you guys had any fun projects. I'd love to hear about those, but I, uh, you know, love just spending time outside. So I, I hike a lot, I do yoga, I now take my dog out for hikes and bike rides. Um, I like to cook, I like to ski. And this year I would say like new COVID hobbies, uh, I learned to knit and I learned to play the ukulele a tiny, tiny bit. So we're still, that's a work in progress, but um, I think it's really important to have things that you love to do outside of cycling and they can be related. So for me, yoga is something that I love to do outside of cycling, but that also helps me with my mountain biking. Awesome. Uh, Vincent Smith, you have a question? Yeah, hi. Curious as to um, how you learn technical skills in like cornering and downhill, like endurance is one thing, but uh, mm -hmm. learning all of the skills to put it together is something, uh, something else. Do you have a trainer? Do you, you know, t tell us about acquiring technical skills. Yeah, it's a really important part of it. And I think it's something um, that it, it is a skill, as you said. So I think when I first started, I started when I was 15 and I was often riding with uh, big groups of boys who already had a lot of these skills and they'd kind of been riding since they were little kids or maybe just had taken a few risks and figured things out. Um, and I always felt like I had these barriers in being able to do drops or rock gardens or any of these kind of bigger, scary features. Um, and I think I learned through USA Cycling, we've done camps, I have skills coaches, I um, work with my team manager, 
who is a former uh, professional racer. So I have a lot of different ways that I work on my skills. Um, but I think the biggest jump happened early on. Uh, I went to a few skills camps and we broke down the tools you need to do something. So I think one of the best examples is a drop. Uh, and that's where there's kind of like a ledge, you hop off it on your bike, you get a little bit of air and then you land below. Um, so it's not the same as a jump, but they often have those in World Cup races and they're something that you actually see on the trails a lot. Um, so that was something that initially like really scared me and that I thought I just needed to you know, overcome that fear. But really I learned that when I went to skills camp, I just needed the skill. So we practice on really, we practice on curves and then we practice on two foot drops and three foot drops and having a skills coach really walk you through, okay, this is what you need to do with your body. Like this is what you can work on in the gym to feel stronger and be able to control your bike on that drop. Um, you know, putting those pieces together then it becomes less about overcoming this fear and more about using the skill that you're confident you have. Um, and so that would be my best advice is if you, uh, you know, have something you want to work on, pick something on a trail and, you know, one, just have intention, think about it, get people to write it in front of you, watch their lines, maybe stop, uh, check it out, think about how you might write it. And if there's a skill that you need, that's something that, you know, your coaches can help you with, your coaches of your team, maybe other riders can help you with that you train with um, to learn what you need to do with your body, where you need to look, uh, what you can do with your brakes uh, in order to make this feature, not just kind of a close your eyes and throw yourself off it, but something that you feel confident you can do and do well. Great, thank you. Um, Liddy and Emma, you've got a question. How old were you when you started to bike? I was, I don't know, how old are you? Nine. You're nine. Okay, so I was biking with my dad at that time. So I would ride around on the weekends with him um, and get blueberry pancakes. That was a very important part of it. But I didn't start racing until I was 15. So you are, uh, you're far ahead of me in some ways, I'm sure. Um, but, but yeah, so I was, I was riding when I was probably five or six on the mountain, but, uh, but on the back of a tandem. So. And your dad still rides with you, right? Not, and not on an e-bike, sometimes on an e-bike. He, he he's sometimes on an e-bike. He's getting a little sensitive about the e-bike. My dad is very fit. Uh, my dad, he's one of my favorite people to ride with still. Um, and he, and I, you know, rode together a lot in high school. He's come to a lot of my races um, and we just have a lot of fun. And so in, in the recent times, I've gotten a little bit faster. He used to drop me a lot. He used to make a lot of jokes about it. Now the tables have turned. Um, but on my harder days, it would be great to be able to have him be a training partner. So he is getting, he got an e-mountain bike. He's getting an e-road bike and we're planning some big camps and rides um, to be able to still do those big blocks together, especially in a time where it's not super safe to be training with a ton of different people. So yeah, big fan of e-bikes because of that, but as always riding with my dad is uh, one of my favorite things. Yeah, that's so, that's gotta be so special for him too. That's, that's magical. Um, Lila, do you have a question? Hi, um, I was wondering if you played or you participate in any other sports besides biking? Yeah, I, I did a lot of different sports. As I said, I was kind of the mediocre. I was not very good at them. Um, so I ski raced, I rode horses, I did gymnastics, I played soccer. I think that's all of the organized sports that I did. I ran cross country as the last one. Um, but I think for me, like one thing I would mention is that I think in a sport like cycling, there's a tendency to want to specialize really quickly and to like be only riding your bike and doing it every day and, you know, training to be at the top level. But there's a lot you can gain from other sports, especially at a young age. So for example, ski racing is one of the biggest things that's helped me go downhill fast because when you're ski racing, you're going a lot faster than you are on a bike. And so it, it made me less afraid to 
go fast on a bike. Um, so that's one example or, you know, strength training. I actually, when I started strength training, it wasn't very common in mountain biking to do strength training. And all of my coaches at the time told me, uh, that I should just be riding my bike and not in the gym, but I had, you know, grown up in ski racing. Lindsey Bond was like my hero as a, as a young kid. So I saw how much they did in the gym and also felt how strong it made me feel. So it made me feel really in control on my bike. It made me feel really strong. And I felt like I could ride better. I got less tired. And so I, I really wanted to do it. So that's another example. If I hadn't ski raced, I probably wouldn't have started doing strength training at the beginning of my cycling career. So there's, there's a lot you can learn from different sports. And I think it can be really helpful, especially uh, in something like cycling that requires such a diverse array of skills. Yeah, that's, that's a really good lesson. And I, we talk about that a lot is that like shredders is there to get girls on bikes. We're not training shredders to be racers right now. We're just getting them outside on, on bikes and then certainly encouraging them to do as many different sports as possible at these young ages. So thanks for sharing that. Um, Claudia, you're next. Is a question? Um, have you had any like injuries? I have. I've had a few. I've been pretty lucky in the knock on all of the wood around me. Uh, but I've had some concussions. So head injuries can be, they can be easy to deal with, but they can also be a really tough injury um, because they require you to rest your brain. So if you crash and hit your head, uh, it's an invisible injury a lot of the time and your symptoms, you can feel them, but no one else can see them. So that was something that was really hard. I actually had a concussion at world championships this year, um, and had to pull out of the race. So kind of got back up, got on my bike and then started to recognize those symptoms and, um, ended up, uh, pulling out of that race. And yeah, so th those are the main injuries I've had. I've had a few of those. Um, and then, you know, just getting banged up in other ways at races, but I've been pretty lucky in terms of big injuries. Again, just like, yeah. <laughs> knock on wood. Moving <laughs> it's on. an Olympic year again. <laughs> we need to yeah. keep all the good vibes. Absolutely. Annabelle, you had a question. Sorry, Annabelle, did you hear me? If you can un unmute. Oops, you're still on mute, babe. Are you talking about me? There you go. Okay. Uh, no, Annabelle. Sorry, Ava. One second. Let's have okay. Annabelle ask her question. Thank you. Um, when did you like? What was my question? Well, Lenny asked her question, so maybe you could ask her about how she stays focused in a race. How do you stay focused in a race? <laughs> Thanks, Brian. <laughs> good question. That is that's another good one. Um, so staying focused in a race. I think is another one of those things that's a skill that you build. So for me, I work with a sports psychologist. I read a lot of books about sports psychology and it's something that I spend a little, a little bit of time on training my mind to, uh, you know, be an asset, not a liability in races. So I really like, um, I was listening to a podcast this week and they were talking about the voice in your head as being your best coach. So I've been lucky enough to be surrounded by really great coaches. Uh, and I try to kind of emulate them in the way that I talk to myself during a race. Um, and again, that's something that you have to practice. So setting goals before a race is a really good way. I'd say that's probably the number one way to stay focused. Um, and when I say goals, I mean, not only the kind of results goals. So that might be win the race or be in the top five or be in the top 10. Um, but incremental goals, we call them process goals. Uh, and that might be like hit that line perfectly in that rock garden or, um, you know, push really hard on this specific climb, uh, or use this section to recover. You know, we, we think about where you want to expend your energy during your race. Um, and I think if you've pre-written a course and you think about it and you visualize it when you're in the race, all of a sudden you can be focused on just what's right in front of you and getting to the next route and getting up that climb and doing this descent well and recovering through the start finish and making sure you have water. Um, so oftentimes I'd say the things I'm thinking about are pretty mundane, but they keep me really focused on giving my best in that moment. Awesome. Lily O'Donnell, you're next. Who's your biggest competition and your go-to dinner? Ooh. 
two different, very different questions, very different. but both <laughs> I like. You said who is your biggest competition, Lily? Mm -hmm. Well, she's older, so. My biggest Sorry. competition. Sorry, what? <laughs> okay, uh, biggest competition. I'm gonna go with a little bit of a philosophical answer here, but myself, um, I think, you know, every year when you line up at that first World Cup, you don't know it where everyone else is fitness wise. So you line up and you're not sure who's really strong or who's had a great winter or who maybe got injured or sick. You, you don't know, and you can't control your competitors. You can't control how strong everyone is or how well they ride in the moment. All you can control is yourself. Um, so I think for me, it's about really like competing with myself to the best of my ability every time that I go out to train, but also kind of competing with past versions of myself. Um, so if I had to, you know, there's, there's the numerical side of things. I love power meters. I love data. That's kind of a nerdy side of me. Um, I love to track things like where my, my power is, sleep, all those things, um, and use those to get better. But I think on the other side of that, there's also the way you feel um, and the way that you ride. And I think the best example of that is one of my favorite trails in Marin. Um, when I was in high school, I had to walk all of these sections of it. Um, and slowly, you know, every year there were more sections that I could ride or all of a sudden I could ride it comfortably and then I could ride it comfortably in the rain. And so I think when I go back to those trails um, or, you know, it can be as simple as timing yourself on a local climb, those types of things, you can really improve that over a long period of time and going back and being able to see, man, I used to not be able to do this climb or I used to not be able to ride this trail and now I can and enjoy it and have fun and be stronger and faster on it. Um, I think that's actually one of the most kind of gratifying parts of my career. <sighs> Favorite dinner. <laughs> this is very difficult. It's probably the hardest question I've been asked because I like to eat so many different kinds of food. Um, right now, I'm gonna go with right now. My favorite post very hard ride dinner is gluten-free pizza right now. I've recently, I've been gluten-free for a long time because I get, I have like a slight allergy. I get really, really congested if I eat a lot of wheat. So sadly I've had very bad pizza for most of my life, but a few restaurants uh, nearby have made perfect gluten-free crust and I've been ordering some takeout um, and supporting those local restaurants and eating a lot of gluten-free pizza. So that's my current favorite. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Eva, you have a question. Eva, let's see. We'll come back to you, Ava. I don't see you on here anymore. <laughs> uh, Sadie, you're next. You have a question for us? Um, what color are your bikes? This is critical. This <laughs> I really is. Um, <laughs> so this year we had a sparkle purple color that all my bikes were sparkle purple color, um, which I was a very big fan of. It also like changed color a little bit depending on what way you looked at it. So that was a big positive. Um, but my pitch to Scott in the future, I hope to make this a reality for you guys, uh, is to have matching nail polish sold with the women's bikes. So I'm working on it, guys. I'm working on it. We would appreciate that, right? <laughs> Color coordination is very important. Um, and I am a firm believer in sparkle lots. Awesome. Uh, Chloe, you're next. Um, have you ever biked with any of your friends? Do they do mountain biking or is it just you? Did you catch that, Kate? Um, so she I think it was a little. Yeah, if you ride with any of your friends, do your friends also ride mountain bikes and do you ride with them? I do. I uh, I have to ride a little bit more by myself these days to do training. So I have some kind of focus days where I'm just out there really like focused on my training. Um, but I also get a lot of fun days. And so active recovery rides, fun rides. I love going out with big groups of friends not as big during this time, obviously, but uh, love going out with friends and being able to go up and watch the sunset on the mountain 
um, or be able to do big adventure rides together. So I definitely still get to ride with my friends. And that is one of the most fun things in mountain biking. You think so too, right? <laughs> I have to say I'm a little jealous. You guys have such a crew. Oh it's a, that's a really special, awesome thing. I think it makes it so much more fun um, when you get to share it with your friends. It's been fun to have because they have the same kind of, we have six different groups of them. So they're within, you know, 10 to 15 girls per group and they're within their peer age group, but also within their ability. So it's nice to have that kind of camaraderie with each of those groups. So we get 40 to 60 of these girls out every single practice. 40 to 60. How often do you have practice? Girls, twice a week. Twice a week. You guys are crushing. <laughs> That's and really I'm awesome. Right down in upstate New York. So it's, it's been awesome. Um, Talia, you have a question. Where did you get your blueberry pancakes after you? Um, Ooh, so there's this tiny little, uh, it's an inn. It's called Mountain Home Inn on Mount Tam. And we would ride up there. It, it was kind of one like legendary day. My dad and I joke that we've kind of like folded all of these days of riding into this like one epic tale. Uh, but I distinctly remember a day we went out on the tandem and I was so tiny that I used his uh, arm warmers as leg warmers. And we rode out and it was, you know, pouring rain and we kind of like went to find shelter in this little mountain hut uh, and we had I think we had enough money in the like saddle bag, like crumpled up dollar bills in my dad's saddle bag to buy one plate of blueberry pancakes and we split them. So that was like one of my best memories as a kid. And I think um, it's pretty funny at the time, you know, it was just like another Sunday, but looking back on it, it's, it's quite funny that my dad and I still go out and ride in the rain and seek shelter and hopefully find a few more dollars in the, uh, the pouch. So not much has changed. <laughs> Okay. Isabella, you had a question. Sorry, I missed you before. Uh, I have two. Okay. Um, wait, I, do you pack any snacks when you go biking? Yes. When, I'll, I'll answer that one first because I'm passionate about it. Um, yes, it's really, as I said before, you know, fuel is such an important part of being able to not just ride your bike, but continue to build fitness and feel better on your bike and go farther and, um, you know, allow your body to adapt to that exercise. So fuel is very important. Um, I try actually to eat some like whole foods, especially in the fall. I try to eat real food on my bike. So I bake muffins or I bake like little bars. Um, I also bring a lot of gummy bears there's some, they're called uh, black forest gummy bears. They don't have any bad things in them. So my nutritionist is a big fan if you guys need gummy bear recommendations. Um, and I think for me, the, the, other, the other side of that is being able to stop for food. So as we talked about the pancakes, um, I think that can be a really fun way to explore. So if you find somewhere that you wanna go get pastries or stop for a hot chocolate, um, that can be a really great way to get you out and give you kind of a goal for your ride. So I'll often do that, especially if I have like a five hour ride, I'll pick somewhere two and a half hours away and go get a cookie and ride home. And that, that makes sure that I get all the way out there and uh, get my five hours in. Awesome. That's great. Isabella, did you have a second question? Oh yeah. Yes. Two. Um, how many pets do you have? I just have one. I think he has been, he's been uh, detained in the other room because he was being very loud. Um, but yeah, I have always, I grew up with two uh, yellow labs. So I love dogs. Um, and I always wanted to have a dog of my own, but I travel a lot. So silver lining of 2020, I was home a bit more than anticipated and was able to kind of get this dog. And uh, get him to an age where now when I'll need to leave, he'll be manageable. So that was a huge highlight for me. And I think um, it's actually, it's been a really great thing to have. I think it's fun to have something to take care of and, uh, you know, to be able to mountain bike with him has been one of the greatest joys of the year. <laughs> that must be really cute. <laughs> um, there's another Isabella on here and she has a question also. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Oh, um, what was like the most, um, like the most complicated um, path that you have biked on? Ooh, probably a race course. Um, what is the hardest race course? It's interesting because, you know, we were talking earlier about going back to trails that you've ridden that are, you know, were really, really challenging. Um, I always think of Nova Mesto, which is a track that we race on. It's in the Czech Republic and it has drops and it has rock gardens. Um, and it's, it's definitely a challenging, complicated track. Uh, but now I go back and it's, pretty easy for me to ride but the first time it was my first world cup when I was 17 years old it was the first international race I'd done and I distinctly remember uh you know pre-riding the course and I could not ride like three of the sections and I I remember trying there's an a line and a b line in a lot of races so there'll be there's kind of the track comes in and then there's an a line which will be a feature so a drop or a roll down or something that's challenging and scary um, and then there'll be a b that's a go around which takes longer so if you're in a race you know it's faster to do the a line but if you can't do it you do the b line um and there was this one a line that i tried probably 15 times and crashed like 11 of the 15 times and i i went to the usa cycling coach and i'm like should I ride it in the race? And he's like, well, how many times do you ride it? And I was like, well, I rode it four times, but I crashed 11. And he's like, no, don't do that. Um, so that's a good example of something that uh, luckily I have now mastered, but it was very challenging at the beginning. <laughs> and um, has one of your um, friends um, gone into um, a race with you? Yeah. So some friends I, you know, started racing with and grew up racing with, uh, many of them have now gone off to do other wonderful things. Um, I still actually, one of my best, best racing friends now lives one mile from me and she is pre-med. So she's going to medical school, but she is one of the people that I ride with, you know, at least once a week. So that's an example of, uh, riding with your friends and you, can keep riding even if you don't race. Um, but I actually have a ton of people now on the circuit that I'm great friends with. So I have my teammates um, that all live in Switzerland, unfortunately, but are great companions and friends. Uh, and then of course, former teammates, friends on other teams. And as you might have seen, if you uh, have been watching the World Cups, the US ladies are really killing it. And I think we have some great camaraderie um, between those top women, everyone really supports each other and is, you know, I have a lot of mentors in that group and then also hopefully will be a good mentor to the next generation. And um, I think that's always special to have those kind of friends from your same country and we're all uh, competing against each other, but in some ways competing together. Yeah. And leading up to the Olympics just now too, it must be extra um, competitive, of course, with those U.S. women. Uh, what's, what is the, uh, how many spots are you allowed coming into the Olympics this year? And what are, what are your goals coming into this year? Yeah, so we have, it's, it's going to be a little complicated. Uh, the points, they're still figuring out what to do. So unfortunately, obviously in the U.S., we have not had many bike races, um, but they have raced a lot in Europe. So they're trying to figure out kind of how to make it fair to reward the people that have been racing, but also not, you know, penalize people that don't have access to racing. So they, they're they just re, redoing that right now. Uh, there was a scary moment where I dropped from first to 77th in the UCI world ranking in the matter of six months, uh, but now I'm back up to top 15. So I'll at least be, uh, be a little closer with that. Um, so we either will have two or three spots and it, it lo looks like we'll have three, which would be a really big thing for the U S it means that we are one of the top two nations, um, to have three spots. And of those spots, I actually secured my position on the Olympic team, um, in it was September of 2019. So I was top five at the world championships in 2019. And so pre-qualified, for the Olympic team. And they last year, um, you know, said that the automatic qualifications would hold. So I don't have to re-earn that spot, which is 
very great. Um, and my focus can really be on getting to the Olympics and as much as possible supporting the U.S. and trying to get all three of those spots. That's incredible news. I didn't want to kind of fix you by saying, what are your chances coming into the Olympics? I knew that you were up there, of course, as the top in the country in the world, but I wasn't sure about coming into the Olympics. So that's great. So we'll definitely be seeing you at the Olympics this summer then, <laughs> which is like yes. really crazy and exciting. Um, it's a- crazy though. Olympic qualification, I will say is uh, a- it's really tricky. Yeah, I can imagine. We were it's, just well, they yeah. do it. Um, I mean, I'm sure you see in other sports, you know, like running, they'll have trials and you have to be top three on that day. Um, and that is something that, you know, I didn't really appreciate about the Olympics, but there will be a qualifying event or a qualifying series. And you have to do well in those specific races to make the Olympic team. Um, so it, it can be a really stressful time. And I'm sure this past year has made it a bit more tricky and challenging, but, uh, but I think, the U.S. is in a really good spot and we have such a strong team, not only in terms of race results, but we actually have some camaraderie. So um, I'm really excited to go to the Olympics and to go specifically with, uh, you know, there there are currently are like four people competing for those two spots, but all four of them are phenomenal people and cyclists. So hopefully uh, we'll find out soon. That's amazing. So cool. Um, we have a bunch That's of cool. questions. Like six fun. or seven minutes left, girls. <laughs> so do it. I am going to ask Shelby for her question. What's the best part about being world champion? Best part about being world champion. Uh, I mean, the, the rainbow jersey is pretty fun. Rainbows are pretty fun. But I would say for me, it was getting to share it with uh, my family and my team. Um, one moment that really stood out is in the in the video, you can see I go and I hug my parents at the end. And uh, my parents come to some races, but not all races. So they're only at, you know, one to two of the big races a year. And to be able to win that event with my parents there, I got to give my dad like the special world champion watch from the podium that really was the most special part of it. Sorry. Um, The next question is from Chloe. I think Chloe has another question. And then we'll go to Sadie and Carmen. Mount Kentucky by K4. How many or which which mountains? What Mount Kentucky by K4? Well, I'm lucky I get to ride on a lot of different mountains um, as part of racing. So we race World Cups, which is uh, six or seven races, and they're all over the world. Um, And that's a super fun way to see new places and to get to bike on different mountains. I'd say my favorite place to bike, though, is still on Mount Tam, where I grew up. So uh, I love going back and being able to ride in that place where it all started. And uh, Sadie, please. Sadie Maxim. Do you um do you know how to um do tricks on your bike? Tricks. I'm trying to learn. I don't currently have a ton of tricks. <laughs> we're we're trying to learn some. I can do some cool jumps and drops and those features. But I think uh, I've been working on my wheelies a little bit in recent years um, and being able to do, I really want to be able to do a turn bar. So like a little bit of style with my jumping. Um, Luckily, I have Nino as a teammate. So hopefully one of these days I can get that down for us. (laughs) Awesome. And uh, Carmen. So what do you listen to music when you're biking? And if you do, what sort of songs do you listen to? Ooh, I do a lot. I do a lot of the time, Um, especially if I have long rides, I'll definitely listen to music. It makes it fun. And it's just, I don't know, it's a nice, uh, nice way to stay entertained if you have to be out there by yourself for a long time. Um, I do not listen to music during intervals though. So that's uh, my one, I kind of like, 
try to really focus during that time. And in a race, you can't listen to music. So uh, I try to make sure that in hard workouts or in those intervals that I'm focused and not um, distracted by music. I'd say what type of music, all different types. I think, uh, you know, I ride so much that it's easy to get tired of different kinds of music. So I have to kind of mix it up. I really like Taylor Swift's new albums though. So it's a good one. <laughs> I saw some good, really good excitement about that. She's great. <laughs> I, if you haven't seen her documentary, I highly recommend it. <laughs> no, good to know. She has a second um, question. That's probably a good one to end on if you want. So my second question, well, it's kind of my mom's question. I'll let her go. Oh, uh, we just, we were just talking about, we wanted to know when we might be able to see you riding um, in any races coming up. Like what are, what are some upcoming races that we might be able to actually watch you on? Thank you. First of all, if you guys uh, do watch my races, I, I really, uh, I feel the cheers. So it means a lot to me um, to have such awesome ladies behind me. And I know that hopefully I'll be watching some of you someday, but if not, maybe we'll just ride together. That's also great. Um, I am currently waiting to hear exactly what will be um, taking place this year. The first race of the season is supposed to be in March in Southern California. Um, and then from there, we go to the Pan American Championships in Puerto Rico. And then the World Cups will start in May. Um, and those World Cups will be probably the first ones you'll want to watch. They're on Red Bull TV and they'll be really exciting, uh, big in terms of Olympic prep for all countries um, and also most likely to happen. Uh, I think between now and then I'm working on being a little flexible. I'm not sure that we'll be seeing any racing in the US this year. Um, so keep my fingers crossed, but regardless, I, I do think those spring World Cups, they'll be able to have those safely um, since they were able to last year. Awesome. How are you situated for time, Kate? Do you have time for a couple more questions? Or how I have are you time for a couple more questions. Yeah. So you should, okay, a couple more. So we have uh, yeah, Ruby gonna, and so Annabelle good. White. I think we'll take those last two questions, okay? Ruby, okay. what's your question? Oops, you're on mute, Ruby. You ask again? Um, I have two, one of mine and one of my mom's. But okay. mine is, um, do you like jumps or terrain, I mean, uh, or bike parks? Yeah, I think jumps have always been a little bit of a challenge for me. So I've been overcoming those. I've had to uh, learn the skill to do that. Um, but I think now I actually really like them. I think they're pretty fun. And in terms of terrain parks or mountain bike parks, that's a great place to practice skills. So um, I was up at Mount Bachelor a lot this past summer and was able to work on skills in the bike park and get some good reps downhill, but also work on, you know, that's a good place to see a bunch of different levels of drops. They often will have a pump track, um, a bunch of little skills things. So great place to work on skills. And, um, my mom, this is my mom's question. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Um, how, how much do you train in a day? Like how many hours a day are you on the bike? Yeah, it depends a lot on the day. Um, a lot, I have two to three double days a week, which means I'm in the gym for one and a half to two hours and then on the bike for two to three hours. Uh, and then most other days can range from two to five hours, uh, which means like my totals, usually I ride, you know, 20 to 25 hours a week. Um, and then three to six hours in the gym. So it's a lot of like training time, but I think, you know, the biggest thing that I actually, you know, have to focus on and that I think really fills your days as a professional athlete is the recovery process. Um, so making sure I take naps every day, I, uh, do a lot of mobility work. I do yoga. I meditate. I sit in my Norma Tech booths and uh, play with the dog. So all of those kind of recovery things um, are what allows you to train really hard. Uh, and that's kind of what takes the majority of my day, actually. Awesome. Um, Annabelle had a question. Is she still there, Annabelle? Annabelle White. Nope. 
Okay, last question then comes from Hannah. Is Hannah Dinolfo still here on the call? Hannah, She's you... coming, hold on a second. Okay. <laughs> Hannah, <laughs> come here. There, you can ask your question. <laughs> Just at the wrong moment. <laughs> So, Annabelle, did you? Go ahead. Um, so, um, when, like, did you ever get scared on one? Like, on, like, when did you most get scared on it? In racing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think there's always a little bit of fear in bike racing. I think it can be scary for a lot of different reasons, rather, whether it's from your own expectations, being worried you won't have a good race, um, being nervous about mechanicals or things going wrong. Um, but for me, I think, again, that work on my mental side of racing has been really helpful. So one of the things we work on with my sports psychologist is controlling the controllables. So being really prepared and being thoughtful in what things are under my control and what things aren't. So getting a flat tire, you can check your tire pressure and you can make sure you have new tires, but beyond that, uh, it's out of your control. Um, You know, your competitor being really strong, another thing that might be out of your control. Whereas, training, eating really healthy, good food, uh, getting good sleep, making sure that you're um, really rested, like all of those things are in your control. And for me, when I focus on that preparation, I think that counteracts a lot of the kind of fear, um, feeling prepared for a race, or in the case of a skill, like a drop, having the skill and feeling prepared for the challenge. I think that is what not necessarily incredible. cancels out the fear, but allows you to overcome it and still um, have a great performance or a great ride. Awesome. All right, last question. Hannah, are you back? Yes, I see you. <laughs> Why don't you uh, ask your question to finish up? Hannah Dinolfo? How did you feel when you won the world championship? Really good. <laughs> um, Yeah, that was a really special moment for me. I talked about, you know, being able to share that with my family. And I think, um, you know, for me, that was really the biggest thing. I will say there was one other moment in my career that was maybe a bigger excitement. And that was when I won the rainbow jersey, I got to wear this awesome jersey all year. Um, And I was a little bit of a surprise winner. So I didn't feel quite as much pressure, but I really personally wanted to do the jersey proud and I wanted to prove oh it wasn't like a fluke race race. I really earned this and I'm prepared to compete at the top of the field so went into the world cup season I trained so hard and I was really prepared and I won the first two world cup races in the rainbow jersey and it was this amazing moment but my family wasn't there and I had this realization that I was I like had this fear almost that my family would never see me win in a rainbow jersey because it's such a a lot of things have to go right for you to be in that jersey at the race and win the race um and you know two races later my family actually came to Leger in France and I won both the short track and the um cross country race and my boyfriend and both my parents and our family friends were there and so that was like almost even more pride than uh than winning the rainbow jersey being able to do that in front of my family. That's incredible. What a wonderful, wonderful story. Kate, thank you so much for joining us. It was just an honor and um, just, it was wonderful to have you to speak to the girls. And I know mm-hmm. they all appreciate it. Maybe we could give a nice big round of applause for Kate. I know you're all on mute, but thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And we thank really you. wish you Everybody. all the best. This thank coming you. Season. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So, yeah. Good luck in the Olympics. It was really, it was oh, great getting to talk closely. to you guys. Yeah. You're the best. So closely, and we'll hopefully talk to you soon. Good luck with your season. Bye. Thank you, guys. Good luck in the Olympics. And have a great ride. Maybe it's going to be cold this winter. Bye. 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 We're not going to leave you. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 <laughs> 
Thank you guys.